In these five porticos lay a great number of people who were sick, blind, lame, withered, um, waiting for the stirring of the water for an angel of the Lord went down to the pool and appoint, at an appointed season and stirred the water. The first to go into the water that was stirred was healed from his disease. There was a certain man who had been there for ill for 38 years. When Jesus noticed him laying there helpless, knowing that he had been in that condition for a long time, he said to, said to him, do you want to get well? The, inval the, the invalid answered, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is up. And while I am coming to get, to get into it myself, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man was healed and recovered his strength and picked up his pallet and walked. So I'm going to be teaching this morning from, uh, from this passage. And my lesson is entitled, Do You Want to Be Well? Okay, you can be seated. In our text um, at the pool of Bethesda, it was outside of the city walls of Jerusalem, and the pool actually provided the water to the temple. And it was believed that an angel of the Lord would come down, would stir the water, and the first person in the water would be well. Okay? Now, at first glance, we may kind of brush past this story. Um, a lot of us here are of like mostly able body, have a little bit of a sound mind, at least a piece, right? And so we may not think that we have much in common for the people at the Pool of Bethesda. However, if we took really an objective, introspective look, we would find out that our souls are sick, our souls are blind, lame, and withered, just like the people in our foundational text. Now, it's important to note that the Pool of Bethesda was located by the Sheep Gate um, in the city named Bethesda. In Aramaic, it means the house of mercies, right? And there's something to be said about the good shepherd demonstrating his faithful covenant love for people and his mercy when he clearly sees his sheep in distress, right? And at the start of this study, I fully intended to like separate self-care and the, the soul care, right? But then God led me over to Genesis 2 and 7. And I'm going to read it from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. It says, Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living person. And looking at this word person, some translations say being, a little bit closer, it revealed that it comes from the Hebrew word nefesh. And it means our personal identities and our unique personhood. Okay, so C.S. Lewis shared it this way. He said that we don't have a soul. We are a soul. Okay, and that's why if you are not stewarding well over your soul, you are not taking care of yourself. Because soul care is self-care. Okay, my pastor said I got to give you a Bible. So I'm going to give you a Bible. It should be on the screen. Okay, um, look at third John one and two. It says, beloved, I pray that in all respects, you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Okay, now I am by trade a pediatric nurse practitioner. And so I hope y'all didn't think we would get through this without an anatomy lesson. So we're about to have it. Okay. So I want to talk to y'all about the anatomy of our souls. It has some key components. The first being our flesh. Okay. We have to manage and crucify that thing. The next are our ears to hear and our eyes to see. Our mouths and our tongues are a part of our soul, our minds, and of course our hearts. Right? And as believers, we have to be more diligent to take care of our souls than the rest of the world because we're born with a congenital heart defect, okay? If you are born and your heart has issues in the natural, a lot of the babies that I take care of, I've seen this, but we too are all born with this congenital heart defect because at birth, our hearts are wicked and they're evil, right? 
and the prophet Jeremiah exclaimed that it's more wicked, our hearts are more wicked than anything else, right? This is why if somebody tells you to follow your heart, they do not love you. <laughs> they do not love you, right? But if we think about it, right, we all love our little precious lambs, our kids that are back in children's church, but at some point, right, no one has to teach these toddlers to lie, to steal, <laughs> to be rebellious. It just happens because we have this congenital heart defect, right? They wake up one day and choose violence. Somewhere between 12 and 15 months, something happens, right? We start to see the symptoms a little bit more. But the good news is that the work that Jesus did on the cross makes us all candidates for a heart transplant. Right. And so now that we are these new creatures and we have these these new hearts, we have to steward well over them. If you know anything about transplant patients, you know that their life and their lifestyle cannot be the same after they get a transplant. Like you can't go back to your previous previous condition because that new lifestyle is going to make sure that they don't run the risk of rejecting the organ, okay? So it's not a one-time commitment at transplantation. They don't take it lightly when we give heart transplants or lung transplants, there's a committee and all of these things and evaluations. We don't have to do that because God is good, but there is a lifelong commitment for these patients to make sure that they do the work necessary to maintain the vitality of the organ and their quality of life, okay? Our quality of life as believers is determined by our faithful stewardship of our souls. And like the transplant patients in the hospital, we have to be committed to caring for our souls, not only at salvation, right, but this is a new lifestyle. And our failure to do so leads to these different signs of organ rejection like rebellion and hopelessness and even death, whether it happens spiritually or naturally. And the truth, though, that many of us have to face is that most of us are more concerned about like the type of conditioner that we put in our hair than the condition of our souls, right? Like for me, whatever Rondell use is my preference of conditioner. Andre uses Tresemme, if y'all were wondering, and he does not like white hair gel. It's a problem for him, <laughs> right? So my question this morning is the same that Jesus had. Do you want to be well, okay? If you want to be well, we are going to look at some requirements of wellness from our foundational text. And my prayer is that you have a foundation that's going to help you be more effective in your soul care. Okay? So let's look at verse 6 of our text. It says, one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him, he knew he had been ill for a long time. And he said, would you like to get well? Our ability to steward well over our souls is going to require a perspective shift, right? One of the primary enemies of any relationship is unmet expectations. And until you articulate your expectations, you find yourself serially disappointed, right? So God has made his expectations very clear. Okay, we got all the translations. We know what is expected of us. The issue is that a lot of us don't take the time to consider what we're asking God for. Right. God knows the desires of our hearts, even if we don't. Right. So you're bitter about something that you don't even know you don't want for real. Right. The enemy uses that disappointment and causes us to become apathetic towards God, disconnected with God. And we don't go to God because we don't believe that he is worried about us, that he cares for us. But the devil is a lie. OK. So in respect to our soul care, I want to give you two questions that you need to consider. The first being, what does it mean for you to be well? Okay? What does wellness look like for you? And so for me, I like to look at five different domains because I will hyper-focus on an issue and be like, this is the only thing that I need. So I want you to consider what wellness looks like in regards to your faith, your family, your finances, your health, and your future. Okay? The second question is, what are your biggest barriers or challenges that are keeping you from living well, right? Um, last year, I had the opportunity to take the year off, and then I found myself missing being a nurse practitioner, okay? Call, call, just seeing everybody's kids randomly at church and anywhere else I could, and I had prayed and asked God when I could go back to doing the thing that I love. 
And what God kind of showed me was this relationship that I had with work, right? I used to work nights. I was a night shift nurse. And it was like, oh, as soon as I am able to work Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, my life will be better. I got to Monday through Friday. I was like, this is very ghetto. Who does this? Why do y'all do this every day, right? And what God had to show me was that the thing that I really wanted was freedom. I wanted the freedom to be able to do what I love and still be present with my family and to still be able to go on trips and have enough energy to do things in my day-to-day life, right? Because God knew what I wanted and knew the desires of my heart even though I did not, okay? And so for the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, his physical condition stopped him from experiencing the ability to live well. And so he had spent 38 years at this pool. He's waiting. He's praying. I'm sure he's pleading. I'm sure he felt some bitterness, right, because all these people keep getting in front of him. And I imagine that day after day and year after year, he felt more and more hopeless, right? And many of us can empathize with that type of condition and being in that position, right? We have these continuums and cycles of disruption, of disease and despair, and then we attempt to fix it ourselves, and then we get frustrated because we see other people who are delivered, but then we remain desolate in our situations. And so we have all of this dysfunction, and it becomes a place that we just kind of resign ourselves to, right? We don't believe that wellness is available to us. And so what the man at the pool of Bethesda had failed to realize, and what we often fail to realize, is that wellness does not mean that we are void of condition, okay? According to the World Health Organization, because I'm a nerd, wellness wellness or being well encompasses a quality of life and the ability for people and societies to contribute to the world with a sense of meaning and purpose. Wellness is not merely the absence of condition, but it includes an individual realizing their own abilities, coping with the normal stresses of life, and working productively to make a contribution to their community, right? The Apostle Paul, whom we love, he's one of my favorite people in the Bible, he was faced with a number of conditions, right? He was in prison multiple times, he was stoned, and he had even a thorn in his side, and the thorn scholars believe to be a chronic health condition. And despite that, he still lived well, and he was well, right? He contributed greatly to the early church, and his work continues to edify the body of Christ today. So it shows us that even though we have a condition, we still have the ability to live well, right? And so the man at the pool of Bethesda had spent these 38 years in a place where he was defeated and isolated. And I wonder how much of his life he forfeited because he remained in that place, right? Many of us have to ask ourselves that same question. What are we forfeiting by remaining hyper-focused on a single condition of our lives, right? We give God all of these stipulations about how and when we'll serve him. And then we, if I get more money, if I get a spouse, I'm going to be more patient. All of these things are lies. We just tell ourselves that. And we have this hyper-focused um, focus on our condition. And it robs us of the opportunity to experience the grace and the power of God. Okay? Look at what Paul said when he pleaded three times for the thorn to be removed from his side. Um, God said no, (laughs) but he told him, he said, each time he said, my grace is all that you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Okay. The reason that Paul could boast despite his condition was not because um, that the condition changed, but rather he knew he had been delivered. Right. And the good news is that despite any of the conditions that we may be dealing with in our souls, we can boast too. Right. Um, Colossians 1.13, it talks about us being delivered by Christ. It said he has delivered, delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to be uh, the kingdom of his beloved son. Right. And one definition of the word deliverance, it emphasizes how God has snatched us out of the hands of the enemy. Right. What the definition does not say is that the deliverance results in the immediate change of our circumstance, right? And so we will never experience the totality of being well 
if we do not understand that God is not guaranteeing the removal of the situation, right? He's guaranteeing our safety through the situation. And that's why we can say, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, like we got to pay attention to the details of the Bible. We have to walk through the valley, right? Our deliverance is guaranteed. And deliverance is not God merely removing the tribulation, but him giving us the safe, like getting us safety, safely through it and utilizing it to perfect our, our, um, our faith for his glory. So I'm going to share a quick story so we can, we can drive this home. Some of you may or may not know, but I have um, a rare chronic kidney condition. It's called Little Syndrome, and I've had it since I was 17 years old. Um, I didn't get a proper diagnosis until I was 30. It's a whole thing. But my condition, it really just causes my blood pressure to choose violence. Like, my blood pressure easily runs like 200 over 140 on a given day. And for 13 years, I was on the wrong medication, right? But the grace of God is that I had been delivered from the start. So the medication that they had me on, it had dropped my potassium to a place where my doctor said to me and my husband that I should have had a heart attack right? I went in for a well visit, and my heart rate was up. My doctor was like, well, let's go to cardiology. Things kind of progressed, and I got the proper diagnosis, right? I had to go through that with God, but I knew that he delivered me because he kept my heart, and when I say my potassium was low, Kim, it was 2.9. Okay, she's a nurse. She gets it, <laughs> and so he kept my heart and continued to cover me until I got to a place where he could change my condition, right? My condition, though, is genetic. It's not because of my inability or unwillingness to take care of myself. It's genetic, and it's lifelong, right? But I'm well, Amen. right? Yeah. So not only because am I well because I'm alive, but of course, over the summer, I found out I have not one but two rare genetic <laughs> kidney mutations and diseases. And my nephrologist had asked if I would be willing to be a part of the study. I love science, and for the sake of science, I was like, sure. In February, he told me I didn't qualify because my kidney function is too good. So I am well despite having a condition, right? So the question we have to ask ourselves is, have I allowed my condition or circumstance to make me believe that, available, um, that wellness is not available to me? Right? We have to shift our perspective to understand what wellness and deliverance um, means and what it doesn't mean, right? We have to understand that wellness and deliverance does not mean that we don't have condition. There are some conditions that occur that have nothing to do with us or what we did or what we did not do, right? In, um, in John 9, verses 2 through 3, the disciples asked Jesus about a blind man's condition, and he told them that it had nothing to do with his sins yeah. or the sins of his parents, but everything to do with God being glorified, yeah. right? And just like the Apostle Paul's thorn, there are some circumstances that God will utilize to keep us humble, okay? Some of us just really need to be humbled and, it re and to remind us to remain connected to him, right? So we have to keep a, a, a proper perspective in order to be well. The next thing that we have to do is understand that wellness requires a proper connection to our power source. In verse 7, the scripture says, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else gets, a, gets there ahead of me. Okay, I want us to examine the response of the lame man to Jesus' question. Notice how he did not answer the question, <laughs> right, about his desire to be well. But instead, he gave what he believed was the reason as to why he had this persistent illness, right, and this unfavorable condition. He said that he didn't have anyone to put him into the water, right? He had placed his hope for wellness and the willingness and the perceived strength of someone else to carry him, okay? He had put his hope for deliverance in water. And while that may sound ridiculous, a lot of us do the same thing, right? Most often, the thing that's at the top of our prayer list is the, the thing that you're praying for hardest because you've placed your faith in that thing to be the access to your healing and your wellness, right? So we have to ask ourselves, 
in what or in whom have we placed the responsibility of our healing and wellness to? Right? Is it money? Is it a relationship? Is it the amount of followers that you have on Instagram? Is it the promotion that, that you've been praying for uh, God to give you after you know he told you to leave your job 15 times already? Right? We have to understand that God is the only source. Yeah. And our ability to achieve wellness and success in this life is built on the foundation of our faith being in God alone. Right? Matthew 6.33 tells us that we are to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, and then all other things will be added unto us, right? In James 1, verses 5 through 8, James reminds us that putting our faith in anything other than God will leave us empty-handed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So while we're praying to God, but your faith is in money, you're not going to get nothing, <laughs> Okay. And what's even more tragic is that if we examine our prayers, we would recognize that we have this really bad habit, right? We come up with solutions. We go to God. <laughs> right? Hey, God, I need you to do my solution. Put some lorry seasoning salt on it and make it happen for me, right? We aren't coming to God asking him for his wisdom. We want him to grant our wishes, right? And so the reason that we get no response to those prayers is because our faith is in ourselves and to our limited frame of thinking, right? If God never answered another prayer that you think, you should, that you think he should answer, would you still seek him? Would you still serve him? Would you still sing his praises, right? One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of the three Hebrew boys because they told King Nebuchadnezzar, like, God can deliver us from the fire. But even if he doesn't, ain't no way I'm still bowing to you. I, you won't, now you won't catch me doing it, right? And if we're being honest and evaluating our heart condition, a lot of our answers to this question is anywhere between meh and nah, probably not, right? And this isn't for a, an evaluation for shame or condemnation. But it's really to challenge you to evaluate your heart condition because it's keeping your soul from being well, right? And I've already said this, but I'm going to share it again, that most often the things that we're praying for aren't even the things that we truly desire in our heart, right? Because God searches the heart, and he tests the mind, and he knew us before he formed us, and he's not going to give us access to anything that's outside of his will for us, nor is he going to give us anything that's going to cause us to self-destruct because he's a good father, right? And so if you've been praying for something in particular and it has not come to pass, I dare you to ask God why. I challenge you to even be willing to ask God if it's in his will, right? God allows us to participate in his plans, his miracles, and his purpose, right, because we're his. And very often we try to hijack the plan and we end up frustrated and we all wind up fruitless, right? So having a proper connection to the source ensures that we bear much fruit. And Jesus stresses the importance of this proper connection in John 15 and 5. He says, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing, right? So having proper connection to the source also means that our condition is not determined by our circumstance. Because in Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, we're told that if we place our confidence solely in God, we're planted or connected, then we'll bear much fruit even in seasons of drought and heat. Right? The proper power source will have you qualify for jobs that you don't have education for. You'll be in rooms um, that you don't belong in. Right? And it, it will have you speaking to the masses even if you have a stuttering problem like Moses. Right? So being rooted in the proper place means that circumstances alone will not determine the condition of our souls. So while the man at the pool was fussing about not having somebody put him in the water when it stirred, Jesus knew that his condition had nothing to do with those circumstances aligning. And so we have to understand the same thing as well. Amen? Okay. So we talked about us having proper perspective and proper connection. And I want us to take a look 
at my third point. And the third point and the thing that we have to understand is that wellness requires adherence to the prescription, okay? Jesus said in uh, verses 8 and 9, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, and some translations say immediately, the man was healed, he rolled up his sleeping mat, and began walking. And the wellness and proper stewardship of your soul is going to require that you fully surrender and submit to the leadership and guidance of God via the Holy Spirit, right? Submission means that we're committed to God's plan and his purpose, so much so that we follow every instruction without any doubt. We don't let any distractions or any disobedience disconnect us. Nothing tap dances on my nerves more. <laughs> hear me and hear me good. When my parents come into the office and they're like, this medicine that you prescribed doesn't work. And we get to talking, only to find out that you didn't adhere to the plan. We stopped taking the antibiotics once we started feeling better and we didn't do the full 10-day course. So, of course, the medicine is not going to work, right? You have to complete the entire course yeah. or you're going to get sick again and now the, the bacteria is going to come back. It's going to be resistant. Yeah. Okay, so finish your antibiotics completely, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and much like we do with antibiotics, we often dismiss or ignore the prescription that God has given us, right, in his word, and we get a set of instructions either from God's word or in prayer, and we either halfway follow them or we don't follow them at all because we deem it insignificant, we deem it too radical, right? Or we just flat out have an affinity for the things that are killing us, right? Because the devil is not causing your type 2 diabetes. It's little Debbie, and y'all need to break up, okay? Okay. Y'all need to break up. You need to, you need to break up with Deborah, okay? All right. <laughs> Jesus saw the condition of the lame man and still told him to get up, right? And I want you to understand what, what happens um, from a medical perspective, right? After 38 years of inactivity. Now, I work with kids, so Kim can tell you, Kayla can tell you, that most of his muscle mass has atrophied or wasted away because... Just like our faith, our muscles, if you don't use them, you will lose them, right? So he was weak. And by medical standards, he should have had lots of physical therapy before he got up um, and just was walking around all freely. At the very least, he should have had some of them socks with the stuff at the bottom so you're not slipping and sliding all over the place. Because his body was withered and his muscles were weak and his soul was weary because he had been in that condition for so long. However... When Jesus told him to get up, the Bible says immediately he became well, picked up his mat, and began to walk. And his heart posture was submitted to follow the instruction immediately. Right? It not only took a level of faith, but also a level of desperation. And some of us have not fully adhered to God's prescription for our souls because we've been, not been put in a position where we are desperate enough to do whatever God says, right? Because we understand that our lives depend on it. God, I'll do whatever at this point because if not, the other options are, are not good, right? And so we have to understand that when we aren't fully submitted, we are still attempting to do things in our own strength. Right. We only obey part of the plan. We don't even check in with God enough for our instructions. There was a, there's a story about Joshua. God tells him, go out to war. You're going to defeat these people. He doesn't get any strategy. They go out and they lose because he was like, I'm just going. He didn't go back and get any instruction, no strategy or anything from God. And it cost him greatly. And we get one word. <laughs> right. And we're off to do what we think. God is asking of us instead of us remaining connected and seeking further instruction, right? I have black parents. If they tell you to clean the kitchen and I clean my room instead, I'm in trouble. I don't know about y'all, but you did something. It looked good, but it was not the complete instruction, yeah. right? Yeah. So our unwillingness to submit to God and his strategic plan of the placement of people, of places, and his provision will have us striving in self-sufficiency, and then we are stuck in the mud, right? That's why you take three steps forward and five steps back, 
okay? You're not in the wilderness, that the wilderness don't look like that. You're in the mud <laughs> because you are not adhering to the prescription that God gave. Not adhering to the prescription, it cost Saul his kingdom in 1 Samuel. Not only did it cost him his kingdom, but it left his soul tormented as well. In 1 Samuel 16 and 14, it tells us that Saul's torment filled him with depression and fear. It said, now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord had sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with, de with depression and fear. These are both soul conditions, right? And Jesus gives us the prescription so we can steward well over our souls in Mark 12 and 30. He says, and you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your minds, and all of your strength, yeah. right? He says that we are to love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And I want us to take a closer look at what it means to love, okay? Love is derived from the Greek word agapo, which emphasizes our preference to live through Christ, choosing his choices, thus embracing his will, and obeying them through his power. That means that when we say we love God, we are choosing his choices, yeah. right? Yeah. We oftentimes choose our own choices, and we don't even consult God, right? We love to quote Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a hope and a future. We love to quote it. There's coffee cups and, and posters, but our unwillingness to adhere to God's prescription for our souls is a symptom that we may not love and trust God as much as we think that we do, right? Many of us don't even ask him his preferred choice. We just be doing stuff, <laughs> <laughs> okay? So we don't even ask him for the choice, let alone do we actually choose them. And just like the man at the pool of Bethesda, healing and wellness are available to us immediately, but we have to adhere to the prescription. Amen? Okay. I'm almost done. Just put that out there. So here's, the, here's our final part. So we talked about our perspective. We talked about making sure that we're connected, and we also talked about our willingness to adhere to the prescription. And the final thing that I want you to know is that wellness requires maintenance, okay? If you keep going in the text, the Pharisees were mad about Jesus healing this man, him picking his mat up and walking was like working on the Sabbath. It was, there was just a lot of turmoil. But I want us to look at verse 14 of the text. It says, but afterward, Jesus found him, the man that he healed, in the temple, and he told him, now you are well, so stop sinning, or something even worse may happen to you, yeah. right? Jesus' admonishment to the man at the pool is one for us as well, yeah. right? That our, the wellness of our soul requires proper maintenance. Yeah. So similar to those transplant patients that we talked about earlier, you have to take medication and eat properly and follow up frequently with our doctors after a transplant. We have to ensure that we do the necessary maintenance work for our souls, okay? Not maintaining an environment conducive to wellness by changing our lifestyles, by removing detrimental connections, and refusing to put boundaries in a place around our souls will result in our not only recurrent illness, but even worsening illness. Okay, so I just wanted to emphasize this morning the need for us to ask ourselves if we want to be well, right? What are our motivations behind us being well? That's why James said that a lot of times we pray for things and we don't receive them because our motives are off, right? So you can stand to your feet.